Welcome to Municipal Affairs, the show dedicated to delving deep into the matters that shape municipalities from across Canada. Now, we're excited to bring you insightful stories, engaging discussions, and exclusive interviews with municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast. Today's episode is jam-packed full of stories from here in Alberta, but we'll also be talking about some stories making headlines in other provinces as well. We'll be starting off with the big news from Alberta. As the provincial government gears up to return to work today with a speech from the throne, we'll be chatting with two provincial representatives about what they heard since the Alberta election in May from municipal leaders. We'll also be heading to Saskatchewan to get a municipal reaction on the Saskatchewan speech from the throne. We'll be talking about the city of Guelph being dragged through the mud at Queen's Park in Ontario. And then we'll be ending in New Brunswick speaking with a councillor from St. John regarding a code of conduct complaint filed against him and a fellow councillor. But first, we start off here in Alberta. In the inaugural session of the 31st Legislature, Alberta's government kicks off today with a speech from the throne, and according to a provincial press release, the government will be introducing legislation that will deliver on the platform commitments and the mandate received from Alberta voters in the May 2023 election. Proposed legislation will maintain Alberta's status as a magnet for investment and growth by protecting Alberta's and businesses against future tax hikes, and safeguarding pensions and make housekeeping amendments to tax laws. Additionally, proposed legislation will include further strengthening Alberta's case against those who helped create the opioid crisis and amendments to improve clarity and ensure legislation aligns with current practices and recent court rulings. Now, we sat down with Municipal Affairs Minister, the Honourable Rick McIver, recently regarding this upcoming session and what he has heard over the last few months from municipal leaders. We will be discussing LGF funding, the most recent Alberta Municipalities Conference in Edmonton, and what his priorities will be as the Municipal Affairs Minister in the first session of the 31st Legislature. Minister, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today. I I want to start with a general question as you were gearing up to head back to the Legislative Assembly here on October 30th with the speech from the throne and the return of the government. uh, What have you been hearing from municipalities when you've been talking to them, whether it be at the Alberta Municipalities Conference or one-on-one in their municipalities? Well, no big surprise there. Uh, I hear I could have answered that say, with this question the same way 10 years ago or five years ago or today is that they want more money. <laughs> and that will be the main thing I hear next year and the year after and five years after that too, which, and, which is true. And it's also their job. So it's uh, nothing has changed. They, um, they, they have lots of challenges. Um, keeping up with infrastructure requirements and all the other things, the the services that they need to provide for their citizens. So they are forever, like all governments, I suppose, uh, hungry for cash. And uh, we are one of the sources of that cash. So they're uh, constantly uh, lobbying and and, uh, asking and demanding and suggesting and uh, finding every other which way to try to get to uh, provide those services and pay those bills. So what do you see as your role in this upcoming session to address some of those needs, especially when it comes to funding? Because I'm hearing probably the exact same thing you're hearing when I speak to municipal leaders from across Alberta, and infrastructure funding is probably the biggest issue. I know you have LGFF. It is a changeover for MSI. But what are you going to hopefully be doing in the next session to alleviate some of those concerns that municipalities are having? Well, I'm going to get, talk to them about the LJFF and, and, and listen, uh, I know they always want more, but I will remind them that, uh, and they will agree with this, that uh, LJFF is an example of their government saying yes. For years, uh, municipal governments, including when I was part of a municipal government, uh, was saying to the province that we want uh, predictable, sustainable funding, uh, no surprises. Uh, LGFF is uh, something that uh, the governments in the past and, and now we're delivering that negotiated with municipalities and, and it, I think it adheres to all if not or most if not all of those things uh, in that it's uh, sustainable it's uh, it's on a program it's predictable uh, and and the other thing they wanted to do is they wanted to share 
in the ups and downs of the province's wealth. So this delivers those things. So uh, starting off with the same level of funding that they had at MSI, $722 million a year. And one of the things that they asked for is that that would go up or down with the province's revenue. So what we know is the year after next, it will go up by 14%. Um, based on what the province's revenue increase was last year. And when we know what the province's revenue was this year, we'll know whether it'll go up and down or down the year after that. Now, I, I don't want to overstate the case because it's there's nothing in it for me to not be upfront about this, but it will probably go down again the year after that by less than 14% probably. But And we don't know the exact number because this, this year isn't over yet. So... But what's important about this for our conversation is that they will know two years ahead what their level of funding will be. So yeah. that if they have, they have infrastructure projects, they don't have to cancel them halfway through because the money tap runs out. Now, the question, though, has to be asked is, do you see LGFS as being fair to all municipalities? The big chunk of that $722 million is going to be going to the two largest city, whether that be Edmonton or Calgary. And you look at smaller municipalities, whether it be the village of Duchess or the town of Falaire up north. Do you think that it is fair for the smaller communities when we do have two larger communities within the province of Alberta? Fair is an interesting word, and I think it's the right one for you to ask. Uh, and let me just say this, uh, by the end of this year, I'll announce the final formula to the municipality. So uh, I, I can't really scoop myself by telling what that will be, but I, I, they've got a pretty good idea, Chris. Uh, but it'll be as fair as we can make it. And, and I, all I can say now is that if half the municipalities are super happy and the other half are super sad, we probably messed it up real bad. If everybody's relatively equally unhappy, probably got it about right. Um, and the common refrain will be, well, this is fair, but it's still not enough money. I, 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 I think it's a safe bet. I'll hear that from everybody. But it's, uh, and it wasn't just me. Like it was, uh, my staff did a great job of putting this together. And what we put together is what we actually heard from municipalities, from the, uh, any individual municipality, including the big two. Uh, but the uh, Alberta municipalities and rural municipalities of Alberta each made submissions on what they thought the formula should be like. And uh, we looked at the uh, historical numbers and, and, and we asked, they couldn't agree on a formula. And I told them, I says, I guarantee you, if you guys can agree on a formula, that's the formula that we will apply. For sure. Guaranteed. No questions asked. But they couldn't agree. So are you saying that the oh, formula is being held up because of them? I wouldn't I say, no, the uh, formula, it will come out by the end of this year, but I'm just saying they had a chance if they could agree to determine the formula. Okay. But they couldn't and because they have different interests, right? The, the, uh, um, but but I'll, I will say that part of the discussion was they agree, well, some things they did agree on is that some of the principles that it would be based on, some of the things that it would be based on would be uh, obviously the, on population, kilometers of roads, the value of the tangible capital assets. In other words, how much stuff do you have to look to uh, to look after, and a couple other things. And we we uh, took their submissions. We had tried to apply the uh, principles that they agreed were important. And now, of course, they all had different weightings on each of the principles. But nonetheless, we we did our best to meld all of this. And we'll see when I'm able to release the formula. Again, I'm hoping everybody's equally unhappy or equally <laughs> happy, as you will. Because um, that'll mean that my staff and I got it about right. And we'll go from there. Now, the to turn to a little political question, if you don't mind. Um, the UCP were shut out of the city of Edmonton. Now, your job as Minister of Municipal Affairs is to speak with the councillors and mayor of Edmonton. How have those discussions been over the summer months? And are they still ongoing about addressing the needs and challenges that the uh, city of Edmonton has in moving forward? I would say that the conversations that we've had with Edmonton uh, have been more respectful than I ever remember them being. Really? Wow. Yeah, really. So I, 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 I thank Mayor Sohi and his, his council colleagues for that. I, I, listen, we don't have to agree on everything, okay? But you can agree without being miserable with one another. 
and and and, uh, and and they can make their needs known without stamping their feet and banging drums. And sometimes, listen, and in fairness, it's sometimes their job to stamp their feet and bang a drum. I, I accept that. But it's not really productive to do it 52 out of 52 weeks of the year. And I will say, I, I mean, I'll say it again. I would say the conversations have been more respectful than I ever remember them being. So, yeah, my compliments. I, I want to... Uh, so you're about to head into the session with a speech from the throne on Monday, and then uh, some legislative work has to get started. One of the things in your mandate letter that Premier Smith has asked you to do is work with Minister Amory, Minister of Justice, uh, on looking at the Local Authorities Elections Act, if I'm not mistaken, if that's what it's called. Um, what what are you looking for? What are you going to be looking for in that to make sure that our democratic system municipally is strengthened? Well, this is something that the government does after every uh, uh, municipal election, and we look at it again after a provincial election. And the things we're looking for is is recounting the things that happened and what went what went right to try to repeat that, and what didn't go so right to try to improve upon it. So uh, we'll have a number of, re of recommendations coming forward that I, I think uh, I hope will uh, improve what we do in the future. Um, let me just say, as an example, is uh, somewhere in the past, ballots were always counted by hand. Having machines count the ballots is, uh, it's not brand new. There's been machines to do that for a long time. But in Alberta, it's relatively new. So uh, we had a, a rule on the books now that I, we're highly likely to change that says, no matter how, if the machine, if the ballots are counted by a machine, no matter how close the count is, no recounts are allowed. Isn't that all yeah, the case? What you're, <laughs> what you're thinking now, what I'm thinking, you say, what? You know, so I know the machines counted the ballots, but let's just say there was a one ballot difference, which there wasn't a one ballot difference, but there was some that were quite close, uh, that you can't have human beings pull them out and just make sure the machine got it right. Um, that's a problem. So, so that, that's, that, that, that's a obvious little example and now for all we know the machines got it right but there's knowing and there's knowing knowing and to have full confidence in the results of an election sometimes you need to know no if you know what i mean like to, to really know to if, if it's that close to have a group of witnesses from opposing sides in the campaign watch human beings say yeah the machine said candidate a the machine said candidate b stack them up count them declare a winner move on everybody knows you know the loser may not be happy but at least the loser knows that he or she actually lost right that's that's important so th that's that's one little example and kind of an and kind of an obvious one but that that will change and, and other things uh uh so one of the things that I want oh, to jump in here on about, because I heard it loud and clear at the Alberta Municipalities Conference, was uh, there was concern that this uh, review would mean political parties. And the delegates at the Alberta Municipalities Convention overwhelmingly support it, not introducing partisan politics into municipalities. Now, it seems, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Minister, and you, you were there and you were listening to your colleagues in the Premier, the door is open to political parties at the municipal level right from what i understand the door has always been open to political parties that has never not been the case and i and, and i and uh but there is no rules around uh if you were to uh have a municipal political party about how the rule of the money would be handled and how it'd be accounted for and, and all of that so we're gonna we're gonna contemplate that in the legislation and and when municipally elected people say there is no partisanship, come on. Like in some cases that might be true, but I was on a municipal council for nine years. We knew who the conservatives were. We knew who the liberals were. And, 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 and there's no, none of that. None of belonging to any of those parties is not against the law. It's not a negative thing. It's a thing. But, but for people to say that's not a real thing, I don't accept that. Like we all come in to, the world and into our politics with predetermined uh, ideologies and predetermined attitudes and some 
you can say align with one political party or another, right? And and to say to say that doesn't exist, I I don't buy it for a second. No, there may be some shining star examples of municipalities where everybody's just there to like I, I'd like to think even when there's political ideologies that people are just there to make the world a better place. But to say that nobody's aligned with any particular ideology, that's possible. It, it probably is true in a lot of places, but there's other places where it's definitely not true. Um, and anyways, the point is people can organize as a group if they want to in this country. I think it's guaranteed in the Constitution, right? The right of assembly and, and, and one thing or another. And we're just going to try to consider what rules could be put around that so that it's orderly and as fair as can be. And, and uh, there's some level of accountability when that happens. So I, I want to one last question, then I'll let you go because I know I'm uh, you're you're stru uh, stuck for time. So I want to ask: You're heading into this session. What are you planning on doing? What's your vision for municipal affairs in this session? Is there some? Uh, I know the speech of the throne hasn't been tabled yet, so we have we can't speak about it. But is there something that you hope to get accomplished for municipalities when you rise in December of this year? Well, a number of things. Again, the, the improvements to the Local Authorities Election Act, the um, putting in place the final uh, bits of, of uh, ink on the local government uh, uh, fiscal framework. Uh, probably going to uh, talk about uh, how we deal with municipalities uh, on other other uh, issues around uh, policies around land use and development. There's the, the, we, we're in constant communication with different municipalities and they want different rules around that so we will consider some of those things as we go forward so it's uh one thing about it uh we're also responsible in my ministry for the safety codes um building codes so there's a new set of national building codes and it's up to us for alberta to uh, bring them into force uh that's something that we'll uh, be be uh, acting on uh, no one should be surprised about it um, other things that we uh, deal with is there's some, uh, I don't know what's, what's going to end up, but we're having just some conversations with the fire chiefs on a couple of issues that they are interested in having us uh, deal with. And I don't, I don't think we've made a ton of decisions on that yet, but we'll be continuing to communicate with them. And out of that may come some refinements, I suppose, to how, how we do things. Um, I, I do Gosh. have a question about the policies here for a second, because I, I know I said yeah. my last question, but I, I do have one last follow up. Well, go ahead. Um, and I, yep. I did I did not prepare your team for this, so I do apologize to throw it out in the left field. Yeah. Um, we are seeing provinces across this country, particularly the province of Ontario, look at changing the models around strong mayor powers, whether it be allowing for mayors to adapt policy quicker so they can build houses. Is this something that is in the woodworks or is this something that your team and you are looking at? to potentially say, if we need to grow, we need to build houses, we need to uh, give our municipalities a little bit more of a strength when it comes to uh, passing these policies and not taking the length of time that we often see. Because in your mandate letter, it says, how do you speed up permitting processes? Well, that's cut red tape and stuff. I don't think strong mayor really has a lot to do with that. I, I was on a municipal council for nine years. And uh, the... The mayor at the time, Dave Ron Kanye, him and I used to go hammer and tong on lots of things. But and having said that, he was a he was a uh, an effective mayor. He was good at his job. Okay, whether him and I agreed on things or not doesn't change the fact he was he was a good and effective mayor. So, but even during times when we used to disagree on things, there was a lot of things we agreed on. And in our common, there's only 15 members of Calgary City Council, and what we used to agree on, you know, what we do here isn't all that hard. You only have to be able to count to eight. In other words, if you get seven members of council to agree with you, you can do anything you want. And if the mayor can't get half of his councillors to agree with her or him, then I don't know. I think that's on that's on the mayor, the reeve, a little bit, right? And now it could just be there's an honest. Again, we you talk about the party thing. It doesn't have to be a party thing, but maybe there's an honest disagreement of philosophy between the mayor and more than half of her or his council, in which case that might be hard to get done. But I, I don't know. I, I think in a democracy, having the majority rule is still something, a good thing. 
as opposed to giving excess power to one vote around the table. Uh, I guess that that could change, but I don't plan to. All right. I, I think it's incumbent upon the chief elected official, otherwise known as the Reeve or the mayor, to uh, get along with, convince, cajole, um, talk to her or his counselors and come up with uh, agreement or consensus or whatever form of uh, that gets you halfway through the count of your council that you can. So, uh, yeah, I'm for that reason, because I think it's incumbent upon all elected people, whether the whether the chief elected official or a, or a counselor down the line to talk to their colleagues, um, discuss the issues, be strategic, uh, mesh what you want to do with the budget and the financial uh, assets that you're and, and then come to a, the best group decision that you can and then act on it. I, I, I don't know. In my, I kind of feel like a strong mayor model detract, can detract from that. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. With the return of the legislature here in Alberta, the official opposition will be presenting an alternative to this government and will be working to hold the government to account. Now, we sat down with Alberta NDP, MLA, and Municipal Affairs Critic for Edmonton and Calgary, the Honorable Sarah Hoffman. In our one-on-one -on -one interview, we will be discussing what she heard from leaders in Alberta's two largest urban centres. We will talk about what the NDP's plan are for the upcoming session, and we will discuss her plans as municipal affairs critic, her role, and her vision for the upcoming session. Sarah, All I right. want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule before the return of the legislative sitting next week on October 30th. I want to start with a general question because I'm assuming you have been sitting and talking with people in Edmonton and in Calgary as the critic for municipal affairs for Edmonton and Calgary. What have you been hearing from the local elected leaders in those two cities when it comes to what they're expecting and what they're hoping for from this government? Yeah, I'd say the biggest pressures that they're facing as of the elected officials are the same ones that Albertans are facing when it comes to um, deep concern around housing affordability is probably the top of the list. Um, seeing the number of people who are one paycheck away from losing their homes, uh, who are feeling like they're being pushed out of the cities that they've called home for much, many, even all of their lives uh, because they just can't afford the rental market and there's just not um, enough being done by the government to make sure that housing affordability is a priority and, and, and is accessible for everybody. And of course, the other piece around housing is um, how many people are without a home at all. There's no reason in any you know, developed country, especially one as wealthy as ours, or province as wealthy as ours, that we should see as many people who are um, living on the streets as we do. So those are probably the, the top issue that um, both councils have raised with me or counselors have raised with me. Uh, of course, another piece is around infrastructure needs. Our cities are growing incredibly fast. They want specifically infrastructure related to the municipality to be well funded, including things like transit lines and roads, but also the other infrastructure the province is responsible for schools and hospitals. And um, these are things that uh, definitely under Danielle Smith and the UCP have been ignored for a very long time. Now, I, I was at the recent Alberta Municipalities Conference, and I had the pleasure to sit down with some of the uh, councillors from Edmonton and in Calgary. I've had them on the show as well. And one of the things that I hear over and over again, not just from them, but even from mid-size uh, cities as well, and even smaller rural communities, is social services. There's a big pressure on municipalities right now when it comes to social services and the, the municipalities needing to pick them up. What do you plan to do to make sure that those issues are brought forward in this coming session and hopefully have this government do something about them? Yeah, definitely. We will have uh, uh, we have three bills. This is one of the great things about being uh, elected by everyday Albertans and having the majority of seats in Calgary and every seat in Edmonton is that we actually um, have an opportunity to present a number of bills and motions in the legislature. Hopefully we can um, get some of those over the finish line. So we have sort of three top priority bills. One is making sure that nobody ever has to pay to see a family doctor. Um, 
part of the downloading, I think, of what we see uh, being downloaded to municipalities is a lot of the calls that they're being sent to um, firefighters and, and other uh, municipal responders are things that if people had access to great primary care, if they had access to uh, a medical home that had wraparound services, that they wouldn't need to be calling 911 as much and putting those pressures onto municipalities. So we will have a bill that relates to that. Um, and then we will also have one on housing. That, of course, is one of the biggest issues uh, facing Albertans across the province, not just in Edmonton and Calgary, but it's a big one in Edmonton and Calgary. Um, and yeah, in terms of social services, um, FCSS funding, like why isn't there money for the agencies that provide meals on wheels that do other essential services for folks across our communities, uh, but there's money to try to run a propaganda campaign to convince Albertans that we should take their pensions away from them. It makes no sense. And I think um, everyday families in Edmonton, Calgary and across the province see that. Now, you in your opening statement, you talked about infrastructure. Now, Alberta municipalities has been calling on this government to increase their funding from seven hundred million and change to one point seven billion dollars. Um, now, I, I've had the pleasure to sit down with Rick McIver. His interview is going to be airing right before yours, and he said that municipalities will always come and ask for more money because they're doing the exact same thing that you're the, uh, the, the province is doing, but there's only a, a limited supply of money. Do you think municipalities deserve more than $700 million per year? So when we were in government, we wrote up a plan with the, the big cities, Edmonton and Calgary, so that when times were good, like the province is experiencing right now, some of that wealth would be shared with our local um, large region uh, service providing cities. So um, for Edmonton and Calgary, you know, when, when the NDP was in government, oil was about 20 bucks a barrel. Now that the UCP is in government, it's much, much higher. They're boasting these big surpluses, but they're not actually sharing any of that with everyday families. So uh, what we're seeing is um, that the city's being asked to do more with less, and uh, the province uh, is seems very happy to, to wa wash their hands of it and try to uh, say, oh, shame on the cities. Well, you know, the cities are supposed to be uh, orders of government, a level that we um, deal with respectfully and count on to provide a lot of important services to the people of this province. So um, we absolutely believe that when uh, times are good, that there should be some opportunity to share that wealth with these partners who do essential services across our province. So the new LGFF uh, formula has it as a roller coaster. So when the times are good, yeah. the municipalities will get more. When times are bad, they'll get less. Now, this interview hasn't aired yet, but uh, the minister, Minister Rick McIver, said to me that next year will be good, but the year after, municipalities will probably be getting less than they are this year because of just the way the ec the economy is going. Um, that means that municipalities will be needing to do more with even less money than they're getting right now. Um, are you hearing concerns that municipalities are struggling? I know you're the critic for the two major cities, but I want to talk about gen general municipalities because I'm assuming you sat down with more than just the two cities at Alberta municipalities. Yeah, so my colleague Kyle Kosowski is the critic for other municipalities, and we did a number of joint meetings, so absolutely. And I will say, as somebody who relies on municipal services, uh, I don't care what the price of oil is. I want my snow removed. I don't care, you know, if the province says, oh, you're going to have to tighten your belts. I need to have my garbage picked up. Like, these kinds of things, uh, we deserve some stability. We deserve some certainty. But also, when times are good, they should be getting more, not less. And and they no matter what he says, if he says it's going to get even worse a year from now, that isn't very much reassurance. But it has gone down under the UCP continuously, even though the number of people live in our city, living in our cities has gone up. And I would say the expectation that uh, we provide great services for the people who live here uh, has also gone up with uh, the impacts that we've seen on uh, on climate. We know that we have more extreme weather. We're going to probably need to have more opportunities to remove snow in a timely fashion. So um, I'm sorry. Uh, and the province, of course, is the other uh, piece is that they went after police funding as well, downloading a lot of that onto municipalities. It's uh, completely unacceptable. And uh, we, we deserve to have partners who are going to treat us fairly and consistently uh, and provide those essential services to everyday Albertans. One of the big takeaways from the Alberta Municipalities Conference, and I, I did speak to Minister McIver about this, but I want to get you, uh, the NDP's uh, uh, response to this as well, was that 
the Alberta municipalities did not want to see partisan politics entered into the municipal political arena. Uh, they did not want political parties at the municipal level. They did not want to see even partisanship at the municipal level. Uh, Minister McIver has alluded that this is potentially something coming down the pipeline because from what Daniel Smith has said, the premier has said that uh, people have asked for it in your conversations with the big cities. Have you heard this conversation come up? Is this even something that's on their radar? Uh, I was on the floor of the assembly when they voted on their resolution, actually, and it was a, a massive, uh, overwhelming majority that said that they wanted um, to not have uh, political parties at the local level. There will always be a level of people providing endorsements or supporting folks informally. And uh, and I won't shy away from the fact that I've done that. I'm a member, uh, a, a voter in Edmonton, and, uh, and I knew some people that were running and I wanted uh, to let people know that I supported them. And I think that's fine for individuals. Uh, specifically, they were speaking about parties getting involved and parties running candidates and they're becoming um, basically party representation uh, at council meetings. And uh, we respect what was said by the membership. We uh, honor their feedback. And uh, Rachel Notley uh, at um, the news conference she did afterwards said that she would listen to the membership of Alberta municipalities and, and honor what they, they were saying. Danielle Smith, Rick McIver and the UCP, not so much. I want to talk about what your goal is. What your What's your goal heading into this session now? Because we have a speech from the throne on October 30th. I know the NDP have made some, uh, they released their shadow speech from the throne uh, the day we're recording this. But what do yes. you plan to make sure that people bring forward the issues that you've been hearing about and make that basically hold uh, the minister's feet to the fire and hold the premier to account to what the municipalities are facing? When I walk down the streets of my riding here in Edmonton, Glenora, or really anywhere in Alberta, people say that they want a government and they want uh, elected politicians to demonstrate that they care, that they're fighting for the things that matter to them and their families. Um, and it's uh, incredibly frustrating to them right now to see the number of people who are struggling for housing, the number of people who are one paycheck away from losing their homes not even a, a priority for the current government. So we're absolutely going to be fighting for them and showing everyday Albertans that we represent them, we represent the majority, and we're going to make sure that they have an opportunity to be heard in the legislature when it comes to those issues around housing, around um, uh, not having to pay to see a family doctor. And the other bill that we're going to be proposing too is around class reporting class sizes, as well as the complexity of students who are in those classes, making sure that we have uh, an official opposition that's fighting for health care, for education, for affordability, uh, protecting your pension, and making sure that you can afford a home. Um, that is what you will see from the Alberta NDP. And there are a lot more of us than there were before the last election. Uh, we have 19 new members and 19 returning. So there's going to be a lot of uh, folks in there. Um, looking forward and fighting for the future, one that works for everyday Albertans. And uh, we absolutely represent uh, the majority of folks in this province who um, uh, voted in Edmonton and Calgary and, and many other communities. There's a lot of everyday Albertans who voted for their values and want to see those reflect in the legislature. So we'll be excited to do that uh, in that chamber starting on Monday. So I, I wouldn't be doing my job correctly if I didn't ask you about the elephant in the room, and that is the pension plan. You did mention it earlier on, but I want to sort of just jump into this if, uh, for a little bit, if, if that's okay. And I want to yeah. know, what have you been hearing from uh, Albertans from across Alberta uh, on this issue? Because when I go out, it is not something that's on people's minds. When I talk to municipal leaders, it's not even something that they bring up. What are you hearing from, as you say, everyday Albertans on the issue of an Alberta pension plan and the way that the government is handling this file? Uh, just an hour ago, when I was on the sidewalk out in front of my office, somebody stopped me to say that they got the propaganda in the, in the mail from the UCP today saying, you know, how do you want us to take your pension now or do you want us to take your pension in a little while and how great is it going to be? And she is so frustrated that they're using her money to campaign for something that wasn't part of the election plan and that they're trying to convince them to give away their pensions. This is something that comes up continuously throughout the community. So um, that was just one conversation uh, on the sidewalk about an hour ago. We get countless emails. The number of people who've gone online to fill out our um, our petition and to, to let us know, uh, hands off my CPP. And whether you need it now or whether you might need it one day in the future, this is something that 
I've been paying into since I've been paying taxes. Uh, you know, I was 14 years old when I had my first job, I had a, a T4 and got to see that I was contributing towards my future. And um, this isn't just something that's a, a gift. This is something that we've earned. This is something that we've been paying into as Canadians and uh, it needs to be there for future generations. So it's definitely uh, one of the biggest issues, especially among the senior population, seniors who are going they're seeing the cost of living rise. They know how much more their groceries cost. They know how much more their power bills are costing because of uh, many things that have been happening in this province, including the ban on large scale renewable uh, electricity. It, bills are being driven up and this government's talking about taking away their retirement security or gambling with it. And they just don't trust um, Danielle Smith or the UCP to have their best interests at heart when it comes to their retirement savings. Last week, the Big City Mayor's Caucus convened in Ottawa to continue their ongoing dialogue between the Canadian government and the municipal leaders from across Canada. Halifax Mayor Mike Savage, who is also the chair of the Big City Mayor's Caucus, emphasized the urgent need for collaborative efforts between the federal and municipal levels to address pressing challenges faced by urban centres across the nation. During the meeting, Mayor Mike Savage articulated the central focus of the Canadian mayors, stating, quote, When it comes to solving Canada's housing crisis, no order of government can do it alone. Canada's big cities are looking for progress on our federal municipal collaboration in service of our community's most vulnerable, end quote. Of paramount concern to municipalities is the imperative to boast both market and community housing supply. Mayor Savage emphasized the indispensable responsibility of cities to create an environment conducive to increase housing construction while ensuring the well-being of their communities. Savage added, quote, Increasing Canada's supply of housing depends on smart investments in the core infrastructure municipalities build and manage. More homes means more water and wastewater systems, sidewalks, roads, waste removal, and more. End quote. The Big City Mayor Caucus called for the continuation and strengthening of crucial housing programs such as the Rapid Housing Initiative, the Reaching Home Program, the Rental Construction Finance Initiative, and the National Housing Co-Investment Fund. These programs, according to the caucus, play a vital role in addressing the housing crisis and ending chronic houselessness, essential steps towards fostering more inclusive and resilient communities. Now, the meeting between the big city mayors of Canada and Canada's Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities, Sean Frazier, and Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, Mark Miller, highlighted the shared commitment of Canadian municipalities. The caucus advocated for a new municipal growth framework. Savage added, quote, by better linking municipal revenue to tools to national growth, Canadians will benefit from communities that can grow confidently. End quote. Now, the call for collaborative action between the federal government and Canada's municipalities serves as a call for a concerted and intricate approach to tackling the complex challenges faced by urban municipalities. Cross-Border Interviews invites you to join our show and share your passion for public service. We want to hear from you about your inspiring stories and insights on how you're making a difference in your community. Join us on cross-border interviews where leaders from across Canada come together to discuss their communities, their commitment, and their service. Let your voice be heard and help inspire others to serve their communities as well. Contact us today and be part of the conversation. Together, we can build stronger, more connected communities. Ontario Premier Doug Ford said that the city of Guelph is the slowest in the province when it comes to getting houses built. Now, responding to a question around development charges from Guelph MPP and Provincial Green Party leader Mike Schreiner during question period at Queen's Park last week, Ford claimed Guelph has the lowest housing starts in the entire province out of 444 municipalities. My question is for the Premier. This government has wasted years failing to address the housing crisis, breaking all the rules so a handful of wealthy, well-connected insiders could cash in on paving over farm land. Greenbelt, boundary expansion, MZOs. It's past time to start building homes that ordinary people can afford in the communities they want to live in on land already approved for development. To do this, 
Local governments will need money for sewer and water lines, streets and transit operations in order to service new homes. But this government took that money away. And residents are now facing big property tax hikes and delayed home building, making the affordability crisis worse. So, Speaker, will the government Question. make people and municipalities whole by closing the financial gap they created? The Premier. Well, oh, Mr. Speaker, last night I usually don't watch the news. I was flicking the channels, and Mr. Green was on the show saying we need more housing. In Guelph, they have the lowest. And ask the Premier to refer to the member for Guelph as the member for Guelph. Code name Green. We, you know, Mr. Speaker, he was actually had the nerve to stand up there and say we need more housing. Guelph has the slowest housing starts in the entire province out of 444 municipalities. Guelph voted against housing unions for students Order. across from Guelph University. Wow. Where was the member from Guelph? He never spoke up. He has voted against every housing initiative we've had. He's voted for against every infrastructure that we've had. He is anti-builder. He's all about making sure he but puts a little rose bushes in and everything's hunky-dory, no highways. You don't want to expand Highway 7, do you? You don't want to expand Highway 7. Following up on that exchange, Ford took it a step further by labeling the entire Guelph City Council as a bunch of left-wing lunatics. He's going to make sure he holds the mayor accountable. And by the way, I like your mayor. He just can't get up there and make a decision. So he always wants to pile it onto the province. And he's a good guy, actually. I like him. But your whole council and go off for a bunch of left-wing lunatics. Simple as that. In response to the Premier's comments in question period, Cam Guthrie, City of Guelph Mayor, battled back against the Premier, saying in an official news release from his office, quote, Guelph is one of the fastest growing communities in Ontario. We are ready to help home builders and businesses thrive here. We will continue to play our part in addressing the housing needs of current and new residents while focusing on our housing pledge of 18,000 new homes by 2031, end quote. Guthrie then proceeded to invite the Premier to come to Guelph to, quote, meet with me and our team to show him the progress we're making and to discuss the ongoing concerns of his government not following through on their promise to make municipalities financially whole from the legislative changes they've imposed on cities across Ontario, end quote. As code of conduct complaints are becoming the norm in Canada, particularly in the municipal landscape, we wanted to chat with someone who has gone through or is going through the process of a code of conduct investigation. In early October, two St. John councillors were suspended from their committee appointments pending a code of conduct investigation by a third party investigator. In September, councillors Brent Harris and Joanne Killen met with members of QP Local 486, which represents members of the city staff to discuss their concerns amid the ongoing strike and to see why the two sides couldn't come to an agreement after a final offer from the city was presented to the union. A code of conduct complaint was filed against the two councillors, which both councillors said accuses them of several violations, including not maintaining the will of council. They said no promises or information was provided during the conversations with the union and striking members, but rather an attempt on their part to hear the other side of the story as it related to the striking workers, which they said changed their opinion on how it was being approached. Both councillors Harris and Killen received notice of the complaint filed against them one day to them being stripped of their committee's duties. Now, we sat down with Councillor Harris regarding the Code of Conduct complaint to get his views on what actually transpired from his perspective and what it means for his duties as an elected official within the city of St. John. Councillor Harris, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. I want to start with sort of uh, a, a background question, but it's an important question mm -hmm. to get to the crux of what the conversation is going to be about over the next 20 minutes. Three weeks ago, uh, the city of St. John's Council voted to uh, remove you and Councillor Killen from the, your committee roles because they alleged that you were in violation of uh, the city's code of conduct. Am I getting that mm -hmm. correct? Just sort of a, a basic understanding here? 
Yeah, you are. I mean, I can kind of run you through the background yes. of of that just quickly. I mean, uh, so so August fourteenth is this kind of important day for the city because it's when we voted on. Um, basically, we were we were in a negotiation with local four eight six, uh, which is a which is a local union here. We call our inside workers. There's a variety: building of permit instructors, nine one one operators, customer service people. Um, you know. Um, people who work and produce reports, community arts stuff. Like there's a range of people who are in this stuff. So, and, 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 you know, at the time we were looking at this from a, from a policy that the city has or wage escalation policy. Um, and, at, and at the time, you know, the questions we were asking were like, what are these variety of offers and how does it fit? And, and whatnot. Now we had a couple of questions at that, but council unanimously decided to vote this final offer to give to the the folks at local 486 to vote on, which is our prerogative, right? We make an offer. We can kind of move beyond the negotiation team if there's no progress and we can say, we'd like your membership to vote on it. They voted on it and they voted 94% to strike. Now at that point in time, my question was like, holy crap, like 100% of people don't agree on anything. Uh, and this offer as I'm looking at it looks pretty fair. So what am I missing? Right. That's the question I went to is like, I can't I, I can't be the outlier here if, uh, you know, 100 and some odd people or uh, I'm trying to remember how many members are in that union. But it's our smallest union technically. Um, and and so we were, you know, looking at this and we were saying or I was saying this is crazy. And so Councillor Killer and I had chats asking a few questions, but we had an offer, uh, open offer given to us by um, a friend of ours, MLA, um, Kevin Arsenault. He's a Green Party MLA. Um, in the New Brunswick legislature. And he said, hey guys, I'm coming down and I am planning to meet with the striking workers. If you want to come with me to their headquarters and have a chat, let me know. And so this was kind of like timely because we're like, you know what? We need to hear it from the horse's mouth. Like we're not, we're missing something and we're not getting some straight answers from our administration or we're not asking the right questions or some mixture of the two. So we go, we have an hour and a half long conversation and at the end of it, like our minds are completely changed. Um, and we had a, we were armed with a bunch of questions and we took a picture with them and said, look on this, um, there's more questions that have come up at this point in time. We support our, our workers. We support labor. I think was our words. And we'll be kind of going back to the drawing board to ask some of these important questions that we didn't have all the information on. So we go back. And of course, this upsets the apple cart right away. There's a perceived decorum that you don't, as a counselor, you don't meet with striking workers. You know, even though the president of the United States has been basically on every picket line with the United Auto Workers that exists, um, apparently it's, you know, it's, too, it's a bridge too far for a local counselor to get in. And we were being accused of negotiating under the table and all this stuff, which is like, how can two counselors negotiate on behalf of the city? It's ridiculous. But anyway, I, can I ask a yep. can I ask a sure. very devil's advocate question on that point? Because yep. I know that's the crux of what the motion was about about uh, moving to uh, uh, sort of censure you and say, okay, you've broken the code of conduct. Council acts as one, does it not? So when you went and go to talk to the city, which you're allowed to, you're allowed to talk to anyone. But does yep. is there another sort of fine line that it's because? it's the people that are your administration. Does that not sort of put up a gray area for you or no? Yeah. So the, here's the competing interests. The local governance act in New Brunswick very clearly says that it is a responsibility of a local elected official to meet with their rest, with their constituents. Right. And that it is, it's seen as a pretty major violation to refuse to meet with, with residents uh, on an issue. Now, when you're being asked by striking workers who are residents also, many of them, you 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 kind of have this you pull them but and, and so the code of conduct does very clearly say that one counselor is not permitted to speak on behalf of council without permission, uh, and it says that a counselor must represent must properly rep. Uh, I think I forget how the wording goes. It's like either fully or appropriately represent the will of council after a decision is made, even if they disagree with them. Mm -hmm. So to me, I look at that and I say, look, I can say council's decision was to was to is to make this was offer. Was this and offer? You, yeah. Yeah. At the same time as saying, I have met with residents, I have major questions uh, for administration, and I'll be going back to ask them because at this point in time, from what I'm hearing, there are some problems that need to be addressed. And to me, of course, it's a gray area, of course. And hey, 
that could be deemed a violation. But I think the, the, the point of all this, as we progress through this, the 27th, another counselor takes a code of conduct complaint out on both of us. On October 2nd, we get a memo about this. We get an email from a third-party investigator. And so how this process works with their code of conduct, it works very similar in other places. But how it works is after a, somebody makes a complaint, could be anybody, citizen, another counselor, doesn't matter. There's supposed to be a review committee, which is council. Like there's just three members of council who are picked and they change throughout the the, the mandate or throughout the um, the time that you're on council. And they, they get together and they say, hey, is this frivolous? Is this foolish? Is this like, is there nothing to this or is there something? If there is something to it, they can say, hey, we need this investigated. Then it goes to a third party investigator. So if you follow the timeline, the 27th, the complaint is signed. The 20, the, on the 2nd, Somewhere between the 27th and the 2nd of October, the review committee met and a third-party investigator was secured. So the the it's the timing of this is really important. I, I know it sounds like I'm, I'm making something of nothing, but Wednesday the 27th, a complaint is filed. On Thursday or Friday, the review committee meets, right, to have a discussion on whether or not this is reasonable. Let's assume that's the 28th which means they had to nail down a lawyer by the 29th to do this investigation. That's pretty suspicious already. I mean, how many, how many lawyers do you know can you just call up and say, we want, we want to secure you today uh, for this investigation? So to me, this, this looks calculated. It looks like it was premeditated. Whether or not that's true or not, whatever. But on October 2nd is when I find out about any of that. I didn't know a code of conduct complaint had been filed against us. We knew that we ruffled some feathers. We pissed some people off. I'm used to that. I'm used to causing good trouble um, for issues I care about. But <laughs> but like at the end of it, it's like October 2nd, we get the memo. We're supposed to have 10, ba 10 days, 10 business days to respond, either through a lawyer or through ourselves or like kind of like give the investigator some, uh, the other side of the story. October 3rd, we go into council uh, in committee of closed. And this is, again, this gets a little bit ambiguous um, because there's certain parts about closed session meetings we can't talk about due to the nature of being land, legal, or labor. In this case, these minutes are available. You can kind of, you know, you can see them. Uh, they're in the public record. A motion is added. So it, our one of our bylaws is a notice of motion, which means a counselor has to give two weeks notice. So one council meeting notice away before they bring a motion for discussion. And you can... You can force a, a motion onto the floor for debate that same night, but you have to suspend procedural um, bylaw. You have to suspend procedural that, that procedural bylaw to allow for that, and that requires two-thirds vote of council. So a, a counselor brings the motion to say, we need to talk about this, this code of conduct violation tonight, and there was no suspension of procedural bylaw. And then, you know, the code of conduct says uh, in, in section, um, I think it's 1016 or 1013, getting my numbers mixed up but in section 10 it says very clearly when a counselor has a code of conduct filed against them they have the right to respond and to be and to defend themselves and to argue for what the sanctions should be if any right so council can dock your pay for three months they can remove you from committees they can do nothing as well they can just say hey you're offside but there's no repercussions for being offside but don't do it again right like that's the, the kind of range did you have so a question? The, Sorry, the, I do because so the motion gets put put to council and it's literally a 30 second moment in the yep. at the end of a I think it was about a two and a half hour, three hour meeting because I watched the entire thing once I saw. Oh my god, I'm so up. sorry. Uh, <laughs> because uh, uh, I didn't know what it was gonna show up. So I watched the entire thing and I went, okay. Is, aren't you innocent until proven guilty? Like there's those there there. It seemed like, and correct me if I'm wrong here. There was no due mm -hmm. diligence of saying, okay, we're going to let the investigation play out because uh, in North Bay, Ontario, the investigation played out, and that's when the ramifications where a counselor was docked ninety days of pay. Uh, we saw mm -hmm. that in Vancouver, where uh, a counselor had to counselor for Vancouver had to apologize to the person that they uh, harassed. So we're seeing it play mm -hmm. out but we're seeing the after effects but it sounds like and correct me if i'm wrong here the verdict came before the investigation yeah exactly we the 10 days had one one day had expired so we hadn't responded anything to our the third party investigator 
And this is where it gets a bit tricky because the Local Governance Act actually says what can be decided upon in close session and what cannot be. Now, that's a superior document than our Code of Conduct. Code of Conduct is an internal bylaw for the city of St. John. And many, many cities have them, many municipalities have them. But the Local Governance Act is our sort of like our municipalities act. And within that, it's like, it says very clearly, you cannot decide on certain things and you can decide on other things and deciding the fate of a counselor who isn't allowed. So I, I protested this pretty vehemently. I said, you don't have the right to keep me out of this meeting. I have the right to defend myself. It's called procedural fairness. <laughs> and instead of going forward, they shut down the virtual meeting, opened up a new virtual meeting and had this discussion about what our fate was going to be. Um, and as you said, now it has to go to open for it to actually be, a, it's not something that is allowed to be ruled on in, in closed session. And so uh, then it goes to open session and there's this 30 second moment, like you said, right at the tail end of the meeting. And uh, you know, not only are we permitted no time for discussion, no time for debate, not, and, and there's a point of order that's brought up by Councillor Radwan, who seems to believe that I'm in a conflict of interest, which is ridiculous because I'm the one the code of conduct is filed against and under procedural fairness have the right to defend myself, as you say, um, you know, based on any sort of legal precedent we have. Um, and, but the the really crazy part was they posted the decision of the mayor at 9.37 p.m. And the decision didn't actually get approved by council until 10.12 p.m. So in other words, there was a closed session meeting to decide the fate before open. And that's why we've had to go and get legal support on this, because I don't know how to at this point in time, we just don't know how to do our jobs well. Like even if there's a violation, like if there was if, if it is, as you say, and like, hey, there is this view where council must act as one. I don't think that that means council acts in like cabinet solidarity. And I mean, even in cabinet solidarity, that's not a parliamentary rule that's just an it's like an expectation right and we're seeing it happen in new brunswick where there's there was you know four cabinet ministers who were you know excommunicated basically from the progressive conservative caucus for disagreeing on a decision that the government made um at the time and so you know now it's trickling down to the locals we're seeing it happen as you said with other places there's councillors in newfoundland who don't even think they're allowed to use social media because of what their code of conduct says our own lawyers had some pretty stern questions about our code of conduct on whether it was even legal um because there's like certain precedents that exist legally like there's one that's by lord uh, justice lord diplock who was a uh, an appeals court um in in in, uh, in parliamentary process and law in england and he says very clearly that a local elected official has the right to speak boldly and bluntly about any matter they believe to be important to the constituents they represent. So that's a legal precedent that I think we have a lot of people around, you know, there's a lot going on, a lot to be worried about. There's a lot of crises. There's a lot of stress on elected officials right now to try to change the narrative on what's happening and, and improve things. And I think in a rush to do so, what we've done is we've violated all of these like precedents to that enable democratic process and good discourse. And it's leading to it's leading us to a place where we're using some pretty severe instruments that I think are going to come back to haunt us because it's just going to continue to tell the electorate, hey, even if you vote in a good person, there's no guarantee that these status quo individuals or whatever you call them these gatekeepers or like whatever the the lingo of the day happens to be about legacy politicians or legacy institutions there's no guarantee that they'll be able to do anything it's so corrupt it's so broken you know they won't even be able to speak their own mind um and i think that is the narrative that i see growing and that's the danger here and that's why i i say we have to fight this in court because it's like if how do i go forward knowing that we're so many violations of of black and white procedure and and legal precedent by our council, how do I go forward trusting that they'll actually respect any process or procedure? Um, it just means I have a three-year sentence to basically look over my shoulder the whole time and wonder whether or not I said something that pissed somebody off to a point that they're going to code of conduct me again and send me down the rabbit hole of needing to spend thousands of dollars on a lawyer that I don't have. Um, but anyway, that's kind of the, I know it was a long way of describing the, the buildup and the outcome where we're at today, but yeah, that's what's gone into this. So I want to talk about the last three weeks then, 
because yeah. uh, you have been removed from your committee responsibilities. You are still a counselor. Yep. You still go to city council meetings or uh, mm. common council meetings. I apologize. I want to make sure I use the common uh, language there. Yeah, yeah. Um, what has changed about the atmosphere, in your opinion, around that council table? Because you are filing this lawsuit. You're moving forward. Uh, you mm -hmm. and your fellow counselor, Killen, are moving forward mm -hmm. with uh, potential legal avenues. Uh, but you still have work to do. And mm -hmm. you still have this investigation that's hanging over your head where a third party investigator is coming in. What's been the process since this uh, motion has been brought forward and passed at that uh, oct early October council meeting? Have you seen sort of a change in attitude and atmosphere around that council table? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Big time. I mean, there's just no sense that they need to they need to listen to anything we have to say. Right. Like there just is zero of that. Um, we feel very isolated, very much like our opinions don't matter. I mean, when you remove somebody like Councillor Killen was a chair of growth committee. I was on transit commission. I had a number of things I was working on. I have no sense that I can get any of those done now. Because I don't think anybody's going to listen to me. It's just poisoned the environment of the workplace and the work that needs to get done. And I mean, I hate to say it, but as the as the counselor who has brought the most motions to the table um, with transformative ideas to try to change things like like vacancy taxes on housing that's 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 sitting vacant, uh, which we've seen put in place in other areas, um, like working on ones around how we do how we how we look at um dilapidated buildings and whether or not we repair them or or tear them down um you know looking at housing policy reforms that we need to do like potentially you know I could go on like I have been the counselor that's brought the most motions to to council to consider uh new ideas and whatnot and I just don't know how to do any of that anymore and it's like I considered that my bread and butter right finding things that we hadn't considered like elimination of parking minimums, for example, and and bringing them to the table for discussion to talk about what is the city that we need to have of the future and what is the problem and how do we get there, right? Um, but what do you do in the short just term seemed, then? What do you yeah, do in I the don't short know. term until <laughs> this 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 resolves itself? Because it sounds like you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. You want to do good. You want to be able to help your community, but uh, this yeah. has kind of saddled you with a, sort of a, an aura that people may not want to even approach you and say, hey, I have an issue that's in front of me and I need you to sort of help me. And now you have to sort of take the ball and say, yeah, I might have to go to another counselor. Does it not? Yeah, uh, it's a hard question to answer. I will say this, the like there are about 10, well, there are about 15 people that I can count that think council's right on this, right? Um, and I mean, this comes from like Facebook comments. Like I'm dig I'm diving deep to get those 15 to 20 people who would agree with this decision. The lion's share of people, like I cannot count how many times I've been stopped or Councilor Killen have been stopped together thanking us for standing up. And these are non-unionized workers. These are unionized workers. Just reading the, the raw, like, and that council session that you're talking about, that open session, that that last 30 seconds, that has the most views of any council session ever that I've seen um, since being here and on YouTube. And I don't know how many more it would have on Rogers TV. I can't see that count. But like it's been reviewed a lot by people. And I think when they saw that last minute and they saw how this decision was made and how the rest of the council behaved, they couldn't they couldn't see any sense to it and they couldn't see a path forward. So it's it's difficult because I feel very vindicated by the community uh, and the community really supports me. But to take these ideas to a level where that you're going to be able to get something done is now you feel like the opposition party, right? It's just like, well, we'll just shout at the we'll just shout at the clouds until somebody listens to us until there's another election. And it's like you kind of had hoped that municipal government would be able to escape some of those things. That's kind of the design here in New Brunswick, since there's there's no there's no party affiliations with council. You're not supposed to, you can't run as a green candidate. You can you can be a part of other parties. That's not the point. Uh, and like pretty much every single member of our council is either a member of the Green Party, the Progressive Conservative Party, the Liberal Party. Um, you know, or running and, for it, <laughs> or running for it. Yeah, in some cases, it's like you guys, you're partisan. And you just took, you know, two two former green candidates 
and you relegated them to the official opposition. And I don't know what they expect to happen, but I mean, going forward, I think the the best thing I can do is just continue to be loud about the areas where we could do something and aren't. And it kind of, in in some ways, it hems me in to be able to get anything done. In other areas, it's emboldened me to speak more freely and uh, about about these things that I've been trying to work on for years now that aren't getting done and to just call a spade a spade and say this administration's moving too slow or council isn't considering all their options or, you know, we're stuck in this other way. So it's a bit of a catch 22, to be honest, but I, I do see it linked to a, a systemic problem that we're now facing in our democratic institutions. And I, I don't know, it's just like, where does that go? How does it, what results does this produce? It's, it's the verdict's out. So you're going through a bit of a experience in in, in yourself, but you're not alone yeah. in this uh, code of conduct review. Uh, we're seeing this play out across Canada. More municipalities are uh, bringing in these code of conducts, and they're bringing in mm -hmm. uh, investigate third party investigators to review the uh, potential code of conduct uh, failures. What advice would you give? to someone who's about to get slapped with this because I, I can imagine that's the last thing you've been thinking about but i want to know mm. from your experience is there a advice that you're going to be able to say if someone is about to go through the exact same thing i'm about to go through here's what you need to do because you're one in a few right now probably just mm. probably on a handful that i can count publicly that have gone through a code of conduct review and a complaint mm. And still going through it, and I should say that. What mm. advice would you give to someone who's about to start this process who is in your same shoes but in another municipality? Yeah, okay. so that's a good question. Understand what procedural fairness is because the court system works just like the legal system or as the legal system works. It's supposed to be how our municipal system works. And we all know this instinctively because when you go to a rezoning or something that requires a public hearing, if you go into that public hearing having made up your mind, you're actually in a position of bias, which is a violation of everybody's local governance act or municipalities act, whatever it is that the province has to govern municipalities. Um, that procedural fairness is a precedent and you need to know what it means. And it means you're innocent until proven guilty. You have a right to an investigation. You have a right to defend yourself before the investigation. You have the right to discuss what the sanction should be uh, what the punishment should be because you're still a decision-making member of that council and you have to understand what, and this is what I've come to realize. There was, there was a number of things I wish I would have done differently as those moments unrolled. But I mean, to be honest, completely blindsided, completely. The only help I had were that people kind of got word that this had happened and closed. You know, I reached out to a couple of people and they were digging for me as I was in that meeting they were digging through documents for me saying, Brent, that's that's wrong because of A, B, and C, and D, E, and F, and here, look at this, and your own code of conduct. And so I had some help, but it wasn't in time, right? Um, I was able to reference some of that at the end when I said, look, if I'm in a co if I'm in a conflict of interest, by the way, no one can can say you're in a conflict of interest. Like if I don't say I'm in a conflict of interest, I'm not until proven otherwise. So, you know, Councillor Radwan speaking up and saying, point of order, your worship. I don't understand how Councillor Harris is still here because he's in a conflict of interest. That's actually a violation of the of the legal precedent that exists around codes of of, of conflicts of interest. Um, no one can declare one for you, and you must pay the price if you are and you don't and you don't uh, claim it. Um, no one else. So, have you had a chat part, with any of your fellow councillors? No, none of them are have, and I won't. I, at this point in time, I won't because I don't trust them. Right at this point in time, seeing how they violated so many simple procedural pieces, it leads me to believe that anything I say to them now is something that they may use against me in this going forward. Um, which again, like, how do you come back from that? How do you? And that's the way I felt about our workers who were on strike. You know, the city was saying things like, "If you have a problem with your garbage, call the call the QP headquarters because they're the ones in front of our, our garbage trucks." If you have a problem with this, call the, it's like, and, and they're posting like, you know, the wages of some of our members in the union on there as a way to try to, you know, flush that out. Meanwhile, they weren't saying, you know, they weren't 
treating the situation fairly. They weren't saying, you know, this 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 union is the most underpaid of all of our unions. You can argue what underpaid means, but it's the lowest paid union. It didn't. Many of the members didn't have free parking. Many of the members didn't have access to telework, which almost every other union has. You know, they didn't have free transit op options. Um, I could go on. And, and the majority of them were women. And it's like at some point in time, you have to step up and, and call a spade say, and say, look, I know we want to operate in this world of equality, but you don't always need the same help. Like if you start, if you're trying to get to Z and you're starting an A and somebody else is starting at an M, person at M doesn't need the same help to get to Z as someone at A. And in a society where we're at right now, where wages are stagnant and people and inflation and cost of living is skyrocketing. I don't think you can look at the problem equally because somebody, anyway, I could go on about that, but that was kind of the crux of the conversation. Right. And, and it, it just, it got to me, it get, came to a place for me where now it's personal and, and you have to realize if you allow your counsel to get away with something like this, you actually establish a precedent that could hurt somebody down the road. So your question to me, like, what would you say to somebody else? You have to fight this tooth and nail. If you think, and if you know for a fact even if just simple process was violated, that has to be rectified because that creates an institutional memory. And now, you know, another person fills that mayoral seat and is supposed to be chairing that meeting fairly and they refuse to do so. They're standing on solid ground because they did it before and they got away with it. And that's how the legal system works, yeah. right? If a bad judgment is made, it establishes a precedent that can be troubling down the road. And it's way harder for another judge to come and undo that. Um, so it's it's a very important thing to understand what your code of conduct says, what the process is supposed to be, what procedural fairness is, and then beyond that, understand your your le the the binding um, legislation for your province, because oftentimes these boilerplate code of conducts that we just throw on the table as municipalities, they can oftentimes be uh, at least gray or oppositional to the legislation that exists that's supposed to rule the municipalities um so yeah so it, i, it, I yeah, want to end on this last question and it's kind of the encompass because you're now in a as i said a gray period you're sort of still working mm. as a counselor you're still trying to make the betterment of the community but you have sort of uh been put into a box and you've been put off to the side for a little bit but work still needs to happen while mm -hmm. there there's a sort of underlying you still show up to council you still attend your council meetings and still yep. bring your motions forward what else can you do in the meantime because you're not on committees are you still going out talking to people or are you sort of sort yeah. of being asked to sort of stay back and sort of be inside that box until this sort of settles down i mean you can kind of tell that the rest of council wants that they want this to just go away. They want it to be behind them. But I think for me, the, the real work now is going to turn back to understanding the problems and and really looking at and, and giving a bit of an audit on how we are doing and solving them. And it's like we saw this come up at our last budget meeting, for example. <laughs> we're talking about the budget. And like we're basing this budget off of some of plans, right? strategic plan that we have that I was chair of uh, a, a municipal plan around zoning and things like that. What we want to see look like um, and a transit plan, a traffic plan, and you name it. We've got all the plans, right? Play SJ, zone SJ, plan SJ. We've got all these SJ plans, strategic plan, SJ, 10 year strategic plan, all of that. Um, a a long-term financial plan. And we're letting the planning that was done in isolation of this extreme moment we have in society. And it is an extreme moment where we're at, right? With a housing crisis, inflationary problems, uh, with, you know, um, poverty on the rise, people unhoused on the rise, causing major disruptions. You go on. These are not, these were not there in 2018 or 2012 when these plans were written. And so I think the job for me now coming off those committees is I have no allegiance to those plans. People may want me to, but if those plans aren't going to, if I don't believe those plans are going to solve the current problems we face, right? Like I said this the other day, and I, I think it's stuck with me. When you have a systemic problem, it requires a systemic solution. But when you have a momentary problem, it does require a momentary, it, it can sometimes require a momentary problem, but if you don't deal with the momentary problem, it becomes systemic. 
And we're at this point in housing, for example, where there's 221 people on the by names list right now in the city, which basically tells us there's either 221 people currently living rough in streets or couch surfing and almost living rough in the streets. And we don't, we aren't creating anywhere near that amount of housing in the next two years for affordable connection to these people who are living on the margins. Some of them are working. Um, and so we don't have a, we don't have a playbook to solve that. And so to me, that's where the work now is for me is to say, you guys, the plans may be, may have been great when we wrote them. Even one of them, you know, we finished like a year and a half ago, but this problem is going nowhere fast. And if we're not careful, we'll have a systemic problem on our hands. So I think it, it's giving me that opportunity. And I think that's where I see my real work. Um, and it's not just housing. There's other, other ones as well. Cost, you know, for example, we need to embolden our transit service because now having that second car is not an option to some people, right? It's caused a major problem for people's affordability. And the quickest way to cut $10,000 a year out of your budget is to eliminate that second vehicle. So, but how do you do that? when your transit service only covers a certain percentage, right? And then how do you get yeah. that transit service up? Then then that becomes your 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 equation, right, to consider, I think, as a counselor. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most, in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together, we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. Communities across Canada will be heading to the polls in November with by-elections in municipalities from Prince Edward Island to Alberta. In the town of Brutamir, Alberta, residents will be heading to the polls on November 2nd to elect a new councillor. Town of Westville, Nova Scotia, will be heading to the polls on November 4th to elect a new councillor. This by-election is the result of the passing of former councillor and deputy mayor, Megan Bragg. The town of Blind River, Ontario, will be heading to the polls on November 6th to elect a new councillor. This will be the second by-election the town of Blind River has held since the 2022 municipal election. In the rural municipality of Murray Harbour, Prince Edward Island, will be heading to the polls to elect not one but two councillors on November 6th. On November 7th, both the town of Pitcher Butte, Alberta, and the town of Coronac, Saskatchewan, will be heading to the polls. Pitcher Butte will be electing a new councillor, while the town of Coronac will be electing two new councillors. On November 14th, the Ward 1 residents of the town of Cambridge will be heading to the polls to elect a new councillor. This vacancy is the result of former councillor Donna Reed passing away in August of this year. In the town of Hinton, Alberta, they will be heading to the polls on November 16th to elect a new mayor. On November 27th, the rural municipality of Mount Stewart, Prince Edward Island, will be heading to the polls to elect a new councillor. In Slave Lake, Alberta, the town will be heading to the polls on November 28th to elect a new councillor. This is the second by-election for the town of Slave Lake in less than a year. Earlier this year, Mayor Tyler Warman stepped down. And the biggest city in Canada, Toronto, Ward 20, will be heading to the polls on November 30th to elect a new councillor. 23 candidates are vying for this one council position. The results from all of these by-elections will be available on our Cross-Border Interviews website at www.crossborderinterviews.ca and our social media pages. Ensure you like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, Twitter, and LinkedIn for the most up-to-date information from these and past by-election results. Remember to also send us your by-election news or municipal resignations to ensure that we keep track of all of the local elections in Canada happening. And that's all for today's Municipal Affairs Report for October 30th, 2023. We'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude for all of those who have tuned in and watched and sent in your municipal news. Your support means the world to us. Now remember, our mission is to bring you the most important municipal stories from across Canada, and we can't do it without you. So please, keep those stories coming. Share your municipal news, concerns, and even triumphs with us. Your engagement is what fuels our passions for shedding light on the issues that truly matter to our communities. Your voices are essential, and we're here to amplify them. Until then, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking. Thank you.